Hello, everyone. With Qatar hosting the FIFA World Cup in 2022, this afternoon's forum discussion is centered on the health challenges of major sporting events. The organization responsible for the event in Qatar is the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy, led by its Secretary General, His Excellency Hassan Al Thawadi. Welcome to him as he delivers this keynote address. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. One health, one world. I find it hard to envisage a message underpinning a summit as all-encompassing and as important as this one at this time. I'd like to first thank Her Highness Sheikh Hamouza bint Nasser for her vision in creating WISH, an initiative I think we are appreciating this year more than ever. 2020 has challenged humanity in a manner not seen in over a century as we all collectively battle the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, while we must be conscious that the effect of the pandemic has not always been equal, often varying depending on geographical location or financial capability, COVID-19 has a significant impact on us all, and the challenge of coping with and overcoming its far-reaching consequences must serve as a catalyst to unite us. Our collective future hinges on a coordinated and a coherent approach to public health, both physical and mental. This was a necessity before the spread of COVID. And now, that necessity is an imperative. Now, sports must be considered as a critical vehicle for contributing to that shared mission. As societies strive to emerge from lockdowns, sports is playing an important role in our journey towards a return to normalcy. The initial trailblazers were Germany's Bundesliga. They carefully crafted a safe environment for a behind-closed-doors return to football as early as May and in cooperation with leading medical experts, local state authorities, and the federal government. Sports bodies around the world followed suit with a variety of unique approaches to facilitate safe restarts. The NBA completed their season and playoffs under bubble conditions with rigorous testing, technologies applied for purposes of track and trace, and an entire ecosystem built around protecting the health of all involved. We were fortunate enough to learn from these leading examples which in turn helped us develop our own stringent health and safety protocols, which enabled professional football to resume in our country, with Qatar being the first in the region to restart its top professional league. Around the world, professional sports has served as a bridge between lockdown and reopening. These restarts were not only important for the global football calendar that have been so heavily impacted, but much more so for people's mental health. Football's resumption was the light at the end of the tunnel that so many of us needed as the pandemic hit its peak. And once again, it showed football and sports power by digitally connecting people around the world as we all rejoiced on the return of the beautiful game. Now, the restarts initiated have also functioned as a testing ground for the trial and development of technologies and health protocols that are assisting us in managing the transition from COVID life to a post-pandemic world and will help us shape the immediate future of sports as we know it. We still have two years until Qatar's FIFA World Cup kicks off, and we're optimistic that the first ball will be kicked in that new era, where we will all call the post-COVID world. Now, since COVID-19 was first reported in Qatar in March, the virus has presented us with numerous challenges that we have faced head on. These include protecting the welfare of workers, building our infrastructure, creating a safe environment to play competitive sports, and adjusting our plans where necessary to ensure that we're ready for all scenarios ahead of 2022. With over 18,000 workers mobilized on our infrastructure sites at the onset of the pandemic, we acted promptly to minimize risk of infection and to ensure their safety in line with our government's public health protocols. This included demobilizing those aged over 55 and with pre-existing health conditions, and anyone our medical officials deemed most at risk with no effect on salaries and food and accommodation covered for any individual forced to temporarily relocate. The proactive strategy that we employed enabled us to manage the spread of COVID-19 on our projects for up to six weeks until the first case was reported. Under the guidance and approval of the local health authorities, we introduced our own 1,000 bed capacity isolation facility to ensure the monitoring and maintenance of strict quarantine protocol to minimize the spread of infection among the rest of the workforce. 1,175 workers tested positive in total, and sadly, one individual passed away. In general, 
the recovery rate was very strong, an indication of the first-class treatment that our country's medical infrastructure offers along with the specific measures that I, uh, I outlined previously. We closed the isolation facility in mid-August due to the significant drop in cases, and we continue to review the situation on a daily basis, following local guidelines to protect the health and safety of all workers and staff. Now, underpinning the relative success of the approach was constant communication with the workforce. We conducted this through several channels, including multilingual awareness sessions with in-house health experts. 180,000 residents, including our own SC workforce, were given access to an app focused on COVID-19 awareness. And we initiated a mental health awareness campaign in partnership with the Ministry of Public Health and Hammett Co Medical Corporation. Turning our attention to the field of play, we hosted 36 group stage and knockout ma matches of the Asian Football Confederation's Champions League under bubble conditions in Doha, with 16 teams playing from West Asia, encompassing a period of just over a month. Now, to enable the success of the bubble, we worked closely with local government and non-government partners to provide rigorous testing, hotels with biosecurity measures, and medical staff and facilities dedicated to the players' well-being throughout the event. Our assessment of international examples and knowledge sharing initiatives with leading sports bodies such as the Bundesliga helped us develop our baseball Qatar model that enabled these matches to go ahead safely and securely. It was a model that proved successful and this week I'm proud to say that we begin hosting 16 Asia, East Asian teams under the same format where we will witness more than 40 professional matches take place in a positive affirmation in the trust that the global football community has and Qatar's ability to deliver a safe environment for sports within the current climate. The global reaction from fans to the AFC Champions League resuming was a clear example of the importance of sports as billions of fans across Asia once again anticipate professional continental football resuming. At a time when unfortunately second waves and new lockdown measures are looming in many countries, it is an important break so many need from the reality of day-to-day -day life and it offers us, all of us, a chance to connect with one another again, even if it, it is digitally. We certainly hope that by November 2022, we are able to play host to a global celebration in a post-COVID world and connect with one another in person. And we sincerely hope that we are able to welcome as many visitors as possible to our country, as well as to our region, many of whom will be visiting for the first time and experiencing their first taste of the Middle East and the Arab world. We're acutely aware of the socioeconomic effects of the pandemic around the world, and we are striving to offer an affordable and safe World Cup. A significant part of our planning over the last 10 years has focused on working with international partners and understanding best practice with regard to hosting major sporting events under new conditions. Through a combination of dialogue, discussion, and learning with our partners, we are working tirelessly to ensure that we're be as best prepared as possible and are confident we can collectively overcome whatever may lie ahead of us. It is my sincere hope that between now and then, that our societies and communities continue to work together to overcome the pandemic. It is important for all of us to remember the sacrifices and the incredible efforts the medical personnel and essential workers have exerted and continue to exert for the benefit of societies throughout this period. The pandemic has brought to light so many instances of humanity and it's at its best and at its crucial that we draw upon that spirit and that we unite as we navigate collectively towards a better future. Now, as I mentioned in my introduction, this summit and its message could not be more timely. We're looking towards the leaders in global health to drive us forward in the post-COVID world and a return to a sense of normality. And I ask, that we all remember the power that sports has to contribute to our shared cause and to ensure that we harness that power in the future for the sake of public health, for the sake of our communities, and for the sake of a brighter future for the generations to come. Thank you and good evening. Well, Hassan, I'd love to pick up on a, a couple of points you made in, in that address and, and talk, I suppose, about how sport in particular um, can be used to to really sort of develop and, and embed a society. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, look, again, I think, you know, 
it goes without saying, and I think everybody's experienced that sports is a fundamental part of our lives, whether we participate and so on. Uh, it, it forms a fundamental part of our life. It's, you know, the, it, it's, it's part of society. It's part of the community, part of community building initiatives and so on. So, you know, to the extent that, for example, we look at, you know, COVID and what, what COVID kind of imposed on us, right, the isolation, the separation from individuals and so on. You know, I, th I think the return of, of the leagues, for example, the return of, of, of you know, the Bundesliga, the NBA, as sports started coming on, in my personal opinion, it created a, se a semblance of normalcy, at least. While people were isolated at home, there was live content to consume that kind of connected us, even if it was virtually, but it created a connection between us. It's, 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 a, it's a very intangible value, but we tend to sometimes underestimate it, what it means. Um, but I think, you know, with, with, you know, as I said, when you saw the Premier League coming in, you know, Liverpool winning the league, for example, whether you're supporting or not, but everybody was part of that discussion, right? Everybody was part of, we became, you know, a virtual community, but we kind of were all interconnected. And that's what sport allowed for us to kind of experience in real time. So that's from the emotional, let's say, societal point of view. But if you look at it also from the other point of view, you know, let, let's, let's take it from more pragmatic approaches. When the Bundesliga started, when the NBA started, the concept of the bubble to bubble was implemented. It, it, I think it's, it started being, you know, the, the issue of uh, uh, immediate COVID tests were being, were being explored. The issue of kind of putting in protocols to ensure, uh, let's say, uh, uh, you know, the health and safety of every individual being put in place. These protocols were then applicable on a wider scale. They were, they were let's say, you know, the way I, I would call it, um, petri dishes, tests to be utilized, that can then be applied on a wider aspect. The um, advancement, the innovation that was applied to uh, host ma major sporting events was then applied uh, on, on, on other level and other, um, uh, well, there was other applications for it. This is the significance of sport. And I think, you know, if we look at it, if we always view it in a much more deeper way, if we shift our paradigm a little bit, we, we, te you know, we then get to realize that as a vehicle, as, uh, as, as, as a platform, sports, whether it's professional sports, whether it's, um, uh, you know, grassroots sports is a very powerful tool that I think we've come to appreciate more during the COVID time. And we have to utilize and we have to appreciate and we have to exploit it even more going forward. And if people, uh, you know, watching this now and listening to this, they think about some of the sporting events of the past year, which have been postponed, you know, yeah, the Olympic Games, European Championships and, and loads of smaller sporting events as well. How has coronavirus or COVID affected your preparations for the World Cup in 2022? Well, I think, you know, it's very important to highlight that, you know, we took a page out of the country's playbook, right? So the idea was that, we, you know, we, we wouldn't fully shut down knowing the implications that the shutdown has, both on the economy as well as, more importantly, on the mental health and the emotional health of individuals. So we took a playbook, a page out of, out of the country's playbook in terms of implementing procedures and processes uh, to ensure the health and safety of every individual, while at the same time trying to maintain a semblance of normalcy and continuity. And so we were able to maintain that throughout the period. So our work continued, even though it was at a slower pace, but we isolated all uh, at-risk individuals, all people with underlying conditions and so on. We, we, we put them within um, a certain facility to isolate them and to uh, reduce their risk of exposure. Uh, we continued with the work and, and you know, with, with an aggressive uh, um, track and tracing uh, system that the government had implemented. Um, and so work progress and work continued. Uh, individuals that were taken out as a result of being positive or individuals that were taken out as a result of isolation were taken care of in terms of uh, you know, there was no discrimination in terms of healthcare. Healthcare is provided to everybody along, uh, you know, uh, equally. Uh, pay was taken care of as well. Nobody was deducted any pay for being out of the workforce, but rather, even if somebody was COVID positive or so on, everybody was taken care of uh, uh, from, from also from the uh, financial security point of view as well. And so what it allowed us to do was continue with work. As I said, albeit at a slower pace when the numbers were at, at its highest, but work continued nevertheless. So that was from, from, let's say, the infrastructure or the development point of view. From the operational point of view, you know, we took it, again, we learned from others. So we looked at what the NBA had done. We looked at what the Bundesliga had done. We learned from what they had done as well and, and the Champions League and so on. And so we started hosting our own events. So we hosted, for example, the West, West, West Asia Champions League. We had all the countries put in one place. Normally they would play in different groups in different countries. They were all located in Papa. We implemented, and I would like to say we uh, improved the bubble-to-bubble -bubble system. 
because it was a slightly complicated system that we implemented in terms of bubble to bubble moving from one place to another. And despite a number, you know, obviously there are still being positive cases, it was highly successful to the extent that today we are uh, hosting the East Asian Champions League. So countries from East Asia, from China, Japan, Korea, and so on, are actually, these clubs are being hosted in Qatar, applying again the bubble to bubble system that we applied previously, which was successful, uh, moving forward. Now, obviously what this is helping us do is, it's also, uh, uh, we're learning, we're applying it on the ground, applying, applying practical solutions, medical solutions, health solutions, in conjunction with the Ministry of Public Health over here, to ensure the safety, the health and safety of everybody, but in a very practical and pragmatic manner. Uh, next year, we have a number of events that are being held. We're hopeful that by next year, uh, you know, the vaccine, which seems to be a promising uh, mm. result right now, we're hopeful that this will be uh, in place. And uh, we will look at, you know, towards Tokyo, we will look at towards um, Common Ball, uh, towards the Euros that will be held next year or are scheduled to be held next year as well, and learn from them as well. So that by 2022, from the medical and health perspective, we will be ready to host everybody, um, which in which I, I hope will be the first global gathering at the end of the pandemic. Yeah, and I, I think that's an, that's an interesting point is that you talk about the first global gathering, and I'm sure you're already looking beyond 2022 as well. So what, what are your hopes for, for future years and future events? Uh, I mean, look, look, I mean, I think it's important to highlight one thing, you know, or just to clarify, when I said the first global, because, you know, obviously the Olympics in Tokyo 2021 will be the first, let's say, global major event, but I believe it will still be at the tail end or still, let's say, hasn't reached the tail end of COVID. So there's still going to be the impact of COVID and the remnants of COVID. I think by the end of 2022, hopefully from a medical and health point of view, uh, we would have we would have overcome it. We will be the first global celebration for everybody getting together. Um, obviously, there's a lot of other impacts that have to be also addressed, and I think COVID's you know, the, the, the silent or the un, I mean, people are speaking about it now, the mental health and the emotional impact of COVID, both from the medical stress, but also more importantly, from the economic impact and the stress that it has, has to be addressed as well. Uh, in terms of what I hope for, you know, beyond 2022, uh, you know, just to clarify, you're talking about, you know, the, the legacy of 2022, or you're talking about in general. The but legacy, the legacy of one of them, we've always said, this is, this is, this is at a time when I think we are all, we have all been equalized, if you will. You know, it's the great equalizer, COVID, right? It put everybody uh, on notice. I'm hoping that 2022 will be the spark or will be, you know, the major global event where we can bring people together. We've always said it'll be an opportunity to break down stereotypes. It'll break that. It'll be an opportunity for, from a human to human level, from a person to person level, an individual to individual level, to get to know each other, to get to kind of interconnect, to kind of do away with the stereotypes and actually get to know a person from a different culture and a different background as an individual and create hopefully it'll be it'll be the spark of creating a global um a global community a true global community celebrating the end of covid but more importantly also celebrating our uh, our differences and our similarities together beyond 2022 look we've launched a lot of legacy programs and a lot of legacy projects um but to simply, you know, to simply summarize it, I do hope that we look back on 2022 as, as I said, as an event that has added, that has improved some people's lives, one way or the other. We've worked very hard towards delivering that, and I'm, ver I'm very proud to say that our legacy is already being delivered now. When we look at worker welfare reforms and labor reforms that are happening, when we look at uh, the sustainability strategies that we've put in place from an environmental point of view as well, hopefully we'll be the first carbon neutral World Cup, but I believe that the first Middle Eastern Arab World Cup will also add value to, to, to the individuals that have contributed to delivering it, but also more importantly to the individuals or the fans that have come from different parts of the world to celebrate it, that they will walk away with something positive out of it, whether it's emotional, whether it's a bonding between families, whether it's creating long lasting bonds between people, you know, between fans, or whether it's also, you know, supporting the entrepreneur and business communities within the region as well. well I hope you're able to achieve all that. Thank you very much for your time. It's uh, been lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan.